Good, uh, good morning to everyone in Australia and good evening to everyone in the UK. Um, and welcome to episode 91 of Podchat Live, recording this Thursday 11th of March 2021. And um, a really important topic uh, we're talking about today, um, and that is mental health. Uh, and we're really, really honoured to be joined by uh, Joe, Joe Brooks, who we'll, we'll formally sort of uh, introduce in a second. But he's been really kind enough to agree to share his personal story of um, his mental health and, and struggles uh, with anxiety, depression, and and sort of talk about some of the um, the ways he, he now copes, some of the resources that we know we have available to us. And big disclaimer from all, all three of us, if, if the other two don't mind me speaking on behalf of all of us, that, that none of us are experts uh, in this field or this topic. This is mainly a personal experience, but also very much um, designed to just encourage people to be more comfortable talking about this, because as we know, that is is, is one of the barriers. So, uh, Joe, first off, thank you so much for joining us early in the morning, and thank you for agreeing to share your story. Thanks, Griff. Thanks, Craig. It's, uh, it's a passion project of mine, as well as uh, looking at feet most of the day. I like to uh, try and do what I can to get people to have the, the the open and honest conversations and to get them to seek the help that they deserve. So it's uh, awesome. it's, it's an honour. And it is worth noting, Joe is, as you mentioned there, he's a podiatrist. Uh, he's, and I think I'm right in saying you're direct, direct one of the directors of APOD A Australia. Correct me if I've got that, if I've misread no, that. Um, that's correct. Good. My research. Yeah, I do do research for these, Joe, as, as you can see. Um, but more importantly, he has a role um, as a, uh, I guess, as a, is, I don't know, a speaker, an ambassador for a mental health charity in Australia called Beyond Blue, which we're going to sort of signpost and link towards. Um, and, and like he said, he's, he's a podiatrist, but sort of, I don't know how much of your time, Joe, perhaps you could tell us you spend sort of now, you know, speaking about these, these, uh, these sort of issues and, and, and sort of spreading this kind of word. So I started off with Beyond Blue, and Beyond Blue is probably one of the largest Australian not-for-profit organisations um, addressing mental health. Um, started off as a volunteer speaker with those guys seven or eight years ago. I probably do. Um, I, I, I don't do much time, and I do even less time now with COVID. Their, their face-to-face programs obviously gone um, down quite a bit. Um, I was invited to speak to Tennis Australia organisation last year, but I had to cancel it because my son was having surgery, which was a bit of a, a, a uh, an interesting experience because it was very anxiety inducing to have your baby going for surgery, but also be to then try and balance the um, commitment of talking to an organization about anxiety and depression. But I, uh, I had to cancel that one. But look, I, I don't do as much with um, Beyond Blue. I try and just help and volunteer for as many other organizations as I can. So I mean, I, um, there's a, a great group of runners down here in Hobart called the Mo, uh, the Mobart Mobros, which is the um, Australia's most successful um, Movember team. We do the Point to Pinnacle, so run from Rest Point to the summit of Mount Wellington, the half marathon all uphill with one of your uh, older, pure alumni, Alex Ross. Um, he's a part of the Mo, Mo, Mobart, Mobart Mobros. So, look, I... Beyond Blue is one of the organisations that I volunteer for, but I just kind of spread myself across a few different ones. Um, Speak Up Stay Chat is a local Tasmanian organisation that is working to address anxiety and depression. So I, my, my main role with Beyond Blue is to just, um, when organisations contact them, they then kind of think, yeah, Joe's a good fit for that organisation. So whether it's a school or a, a male sporting club or um, a whether it's I'm just the person that's available, I then go out and share my story. Perfect. Um, and on, on the note of our very good uh, mutual friend, Alex, he did slide into my inbox just this morning, asking, oh, me how no. much, asking me if I wanted some dirt on you. And I said, well, I do. This, 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 this episode, you know, fairly uh, important to take seriously and, and I don't want to make light of things, but I have got a few things like, in the wings, maybe for the end of the episode uh, that he's told me about you that, that I look forward to bringing out. Um, so you can look forward to that. You, you know, you can look now, forward to those. I'm now, I'm now very anxious. <laughs> yeah, that's a ter- yeah. Apologies for that. Um, so we want we want people listening to fire questions to Joe as as we go along. Um, like we say, um, it is a topic that that we know is very um, 
uh, it's difficult to talk about a lot of the time. Um, and sometimes it might be easier to, to, to type something than it is to speak. So do, do fly away. That's why Joe's here. We really just want to make sure we um, touch a few bases as we go, uh, things that we think may help people. Um, but before we, we, we get to that, maybe if we could start, Joe, with you um, retelling your story for everyone, you know, where, where, where it begins. Uh, and and the sort of its its evolution through because from my understanding of it when we've spoken before it, it it actually started when you were quite young. Yeah, yeah. So um, I I've always been a warrior. I've always been someone that's probably thought too much. Um, but I remember really the first time that I experienced anxiety was I was in I was in primary school and um, my teacher at the time I think I was in grade four or grade five. My teacher at the time he got us to write down all the names of our family members on a piece of paper. And then he essentially said, if your family members are aged between the ages of 18 and 35 or 36, put a line through them. Um, and I subsequently put a line through everyone apart from my mum. And I, he, the next sentence that he said was that if war was to break out tomorrow, the people that you put a, a line through would be... Um, conscripted to national to national service and in all chances they probably go off to war and they they may or may not die and instantly i thought in my head that war was going to break out tomorrow even though we were in a very peaceful state of the world that my family was going to all die and i started crying i um started to pr breathe heavily um and i put my hand up and said that I was feeling sick but obviously that was a, a bit of a, a mask to to show that this was probably my first panic attack and I've had a number since um, and it's still something that I, I try and work to, to balance today. Um, you can probably question his teaching methods and whether that was the, the right way to teach um, primary school age kids around national service and national conscription but um, we know that I guess in in Australia that we've kind of got like 1 million people plus and that's pro and these figures are, are pre-COVID. So 1 million are experiencing depression and 2 million are experiencing anxiety. So, and I'm sure that those figures have gone way up um, since over the past 12 to 18, 18 months in these unprecedented times as we all like to hear. Um, so it, it's fair to say that probably people there'll be some people within the stream or watching online that have either been experienced anxiety and depression themselves or a family member or a friend may have so everyone's got their own story and er everyone's got their own way of um feeling being touched by anxiety and depression it, it takes many many faces it takes many many um signs and symptoms so we know that like depression is obviously it's more than just low low mood it's more than just feeling um, feeling sh shit, pardon my language. Um, it's a serious illness that can really impact us it, and it, it can be physically disabling. Um, I guess my, my, my story then from kind of primary school wasn't too bad. Through high school, I, I managed to kind of control things with a decent amount of um, physical activity and pretty good support with family members. But then... As I went to university, um, my mental health probably be began to kind of deteriorate. Um, it was it was in my third year of university at Latrobe Latrobe Uni, um, and I can probably I can safely say that well, I was I was at Melbourne. My parents were in regional New South Wales, so about um, six hours drive away. That wasn't that wasn't too much of an issue. I was um, used to being away from them. I was I went to boarding school for year 11, 11 and twelve. Um, but I obviously had a number of worries and a number of personal concerns and that they were probably a fear of failure. Um, uh, personal expectations, I wouldn't necessarily say it was perfectionism, but it was a, a pretty high personal ex expectations. And combining that with some pretty poor coping mechanisms, which um, our mutual friend Alex Ross probably knows all, all about. Um, from our university days, he... Uh, that really resulted in me having a breakdown in my third year of university. And so for me, it was losing interest in things that I I love. So it was I'd play I play I played play AFL football. Um 
I was skipping training. I wasn't enjoying it. I was really going through the motions, um, watching comedies on TV or TV funny shows like skit shows and those kind of things. They weren't funny anymore. Probably the biggest thing for me though was my my sleep. My sleep was just absolutely shot. I would struggle to go to sleep and that was a combination of me just thoughts constantly swirling in 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 my in my head um so if we kind of focus our attention on the the third year of uni i couldn't focus on any tasks and my sleep was really affected so every decision i would just focus on what potentially could go wrong and what what then i thought would go wrong and so I was constantly worried about my future, constantly worried about um, being a failure and constantly worried about not living up to the expectations of of my family and friends. Um, I was trying to cope, trying to do healthy coping mechanisms like football and being physically active, but they just weren't enough. They just weren't enough for me. Um, uh, I, I can remember really kind of going through the day and really struggling to find something that would make me smile, really struggling to find something that would make me laugh. And even if it was, it was more of a token like it was kind of a social interaction where I thought that I needed to laugh, but it was it wasn't a, a hearty belly laugh that you know that you can really experience sometimes. Um, there is, a, and I kind of wish that I knew about this at the time, but there, there's a, a section on the Beyond Blue website that's designed at people of this age through late late high school and university is called the desk, which is kind of really targeted towards people um, at, at this time. So. I was missing missing classes. I was staying staying home. I was playing FIFA. I was just binge watching TV, which was kind of a numbing. It was just a numbing effect of me. It was just kind of a bit of a escapism because I was I was worried about um, failing, but then it was kind of compounding by not going to class or not doing anything, which made me more worried about failing. So it was kind of it wasn't necessarily the best coping mechanism, and. My friends probably knew something was up. They probably knew something wasn't necessarily right. Um, I was binge drinking quite heavily to kind of make to make things feel okay, but that was obviously then compounding how I was feeling the ne- the next day. But binge drinking in those kind of years of life is pretty normal, um, and that's a, a social norm. Now I'm not going to comment whether that's normal or not, but it it also can mean that you can then kind of flip through the cracks quite easy if that's one of your coping mechanisms. Um, it's it's really tough like I often think back to this time in my life and I think that if someone had asked me if I was okay whether I would have actually said no things aren't okay or whether I would have um, <clears throat> kind of taken them up on it and said um, or whether I would have just kind of diffused it and say yeah yeah I'm sweet just just a bit tough at the moment or just going through a bit of something um, Probably, I think the thing that I really look back on now is to to say and to think, you know what, like, it, those first conversations are really, really hard. Um, and there's obviously a lot of strategies that you can do to try and have those first conversations that we can touch on later. But at the end of the day, people do really care about you. And I think that that's one of the really key things that we need to know is, is that even if you're feeling really horrible and feeling really down and in the dumps know that there are people out there that do care for you and do do love you and do want what's best for you and that's just part of being a, a good a good human being a part of a community and i think we're really lucky with podiatry being a great being a, a small community um but yeah, joe, I, joe can i just can i just make a comment joe yeah. I, I look i i know you joe but i can't say i know you well but what I do know of you, if someone did ask you back then if you are okay, I suspect you would have said you were okay. You would have brushed them off. Yeah. Would that be a fair judgment? Yeah. And and I've learnt to realise when I'm not okay and when I am okay. And back then I probably yeah. didn't realise that I wasn't okay. Yeah. I do have a bit of a bravado and I do have a um, probably a uh, – I probably cope by – I probably – People, when I've kind of shared this story, that, that have known me, have said, "You don't have depression. You, you're like you're you're a happy-go-lucky guy." Like, and and that that then comes back to that that point of of people realizing that depression does take many faces. It doesn't discriminate. Mental health doesn't discriminate. It can be a you can be a, a successful business person. You can be a, a sporting star. You can be. It's not just the person that you kind of walk past the street with their head 
down in their hands and looking at their shoes. Like it, it takes many, many faces and it doesn't necessarily um, fit with the, the, st the stereotypes. Um, so back back then, I, I then went and sought medical help. So I really... Um, and that was after a lot of conversations with my mum. And my mum's my mum is the, the 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 person that I mention here a lot is that she's the first person that I really spoke to. And my mum is someone that that has has also um, had had some struggles in her life. But she's the one that really was the one that that pushed me to to seek medical help. Um, and it's. It's essentially why I'm here, why, why I do this. The first person you speak to, I'm lucky that I've got a really supportive mum and a really supportive family and a really supportive group of friends. But the first person you speak to is always the person that you want to try and get. Um, that, that, sorry, it's the first person you speak to is always, and the first conversation is always the hardest. And that's why I'm here. I just want to make that first conversation easier. And if we can get, if today, if we get one person that takes that takes this conversation and says, I'm not right, and goes and speaks to, or goes and speaks to a family member and says, "I don't think I'm right. I think I need some help." If we get one person from this to, to go and seek the help they they deserve, then we've achieved our goal. Um, and that that's absolutely the the reason that I, I'm here. But the doc, um, I'm sure that uh, we've all had these. That was I went to a university doctor very quick. Um, looking at a computer screen, printed off a, a sheet of paper, it got me to fill out a depression and anxiety questionnaire, a tick box set up, looked at it, t tallied up the numbers, and she said, you're moderately uh, moderately to severely depressed. Um, here's, a, here's a prescription. I was like, oh, okay. Um, what does that mean? Like, what do I... And I, I didn't really necessarily know or understand. Like, I... I got probably that I was I wasn't feeling great, but it it, it was a real. Um, I started taking me medication, but I I didn't feel like I kind of knew any coping mechanisms or didn't really know anything. Um, didn't really know how to necessarily take those next steps or how to feel better. Um, and so started taking medication, and four to six weeks or no, a couple of weeks went by, and I wasn't necessarily feeling any better. If anything, I was potentially feeling worse. And at this stage, I was calling my mum most days. Um, so then, and she was like, "Go, go back to the doctor." And the doctor was like, "Well, the medication will probably take a little while to kick in. Why don't you, why don't you go see a psychologist?" And psychologist, I went and had a few appointments and I found it I found it okay um, we chatted we chatted a lot about um, my AFL team the Western Bulldogs which is ironic um, Western Bulldogs are like a not very successful team in, in the AFL and I often say at this point that it's ironic that um, I'm seeing someone about my head who also supports Western Bulldogs um, it's kind of a bit of a irony that I needed to see someone about my mental health to find a fellow supporter of the Western Bulldogs. They're not a very commonly supported team. Um, but we we mainly spoke about footy and I get that he was trying to build rapport, but I was like in the heat of the battle and I needed some coping mechanisms and he didn't really provide those to me at that particular time. Um, Actually, Joe, so, sorry, can I, can I just clarify, Joe, what, about what year are we talking about now? Um, so this is two thousand and eight or nine. So we weren't yeah. okay. pre yeah, so pre our twenty sixteen premiership. Yeah, I was going to say, you know, that that might be a bit of an issue there, but yeah. <laughs> um, probably last things really hit a climax last last week of term. So third year at uni, three assignments were due, followed by four exams the next week, and then two weeks placement across Melbourne. So I was barely sleeping with the thoughts going through my head, I'm going to fail these exams. Even if I fail these exams, there's no way that I'm going to be able to sleep and then get enough to drive safely across Melbourne to get to my placement on time, which is mean, and I probably will, will be late. That means I'm going to fail, fail my placement. Um, and then these thoughts then cascaded into me um, failing university, dropping out of university, um, my family disowning me, me becoming homeless, me being a single homeless man that never seeks happiness in his life ever. So that big whirlpool of thoughts, um, that was obviously 
anxiety. That that is the way that anxiety affected me. Um, every single situation I looked at, I pictured the worst outcome, and my anxiety was then causing a depressive state. Um, so we know that anxiety is more than just feeling stressed and worried. It's like stress and anxious feelings are normal for certain situations, but it's when they don't go away and it's when they constantly continue is when we, we, we can see anxiety is um, a, a medical condition. And I also use the example here of public speaking or doing your first ever pod chat live is it's anxious, it's stressful, but as soon as you start and as soon as it's over, those feelings subside. Whereas if we compare that to anxiety, it doesn't, it continues. Every single decision is difficult. Um, so you can see that I was experiencing anxiety and my anxiety, my anxiety was actually at the point of where I was physically, not just mentally disabled, where I was really struggling to make decisions. I was physically disabled and like I was at the point of where I can remember clearly, I would ring my mum and I would be lying in bed and, she, and it, it'd be the morning and she'd be like, okay, Joe, where are you? And I'll be like, I'm, I'm lying in bed. And she's like, okay, stand up. Uh, do I have to just stand up? And then she'd be like, okay, are you, are you vertical? And then it would be, okay, walk downstairs, hold onto the banister, don't fall, um, go and make a cup of tea, go and get some, go and get some breakfast. Um, and so my, my mental health was then affecting my physical health. And that was something that, 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 that was really, um, it was tough. It was tough. Um, so later on that day, after kind of speaking to my mum, I remember, I remember this, this well as well. I, I was um, driving across Melbourne to pay rent to my real estate agent back before we had bloody BPay and all EFTs <laughs> and all, all those kind of things where I needed to take my money to the real estate agent. Um, and I, I, I got anxious about something, so I was driving my car. I called, I called my mum and, um, and then I hear the police siren and I hear the police, the police lights and I see the police lights and obviously I'm not advocating for driving on your phone, which is obviously silly, but um, at this point, like I pulled over and I'm hysterical. I'm crying. I'm hyperventilating. And the policeman looked in and he's like, are you all right, mate? And I'm like, oh, no, nah, I'm not, not in a good spot. Um, he still gave me a ticket, but at that point, I, uh, I managed to get home and then my mum and dad said, look, we're coming down to get you. So I, uh, I then spent the next um, six or eight weeks at their house. But during that six or eight weeks, I obviously um, I needed to, to ring my year level su supervisor, um, the, the great Dan Bonanno. Um, and he's one of, one of the great guys that I, every single time I see him, I, I thank him because he was just amazing. And again, it comes back to that point that if you need help, the people around you want what's best for you. Um, but it's obviously tough to seek that help. But once you seek that help, you don't realise that, that people really want what's best for you. Dan was like, mate, university will be here. Go away. Get yourself better. Make sure that you can get in a good state of mind. And don't stress. You, you, you're a good guy. You, you, you will come back from this. Um, so it was, um, and it's just reassuring to know that, that people actually like my, my fear was like that they were going to be, oh, we've got to re we've got to cancel your placement. You've got, got to reorganize y your exams, all these kind of things. This is a real hassle when really they're like, they're, they're humans. They want people to, they want people to be happy, healthy. They, they're not in it to, to make people upset so the people around the, the people around you even if you feel that you're a burden you're not you're not they want what's people want what's best for you um and it's 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 part of being open and honest and communicating and talking to them so that so that they can then help you get the help that you deserve um so I got advice at this point in time to defer my university from a, a few family members, but one, one family member actually kind of said to me, try, don't, try not to, because once you defer uni, you may never go back. And for the people out there that do need to defer uni for their particular circumstance, 
that's fine. That's good. I was really lucky that all this occurred around the mid-semester break. So I had a decent amount of time to really kind of just take stock. Um, and so I guess I was lucky that I could have six to eight weeks where I, I really did nothing apart from watch. I think the World Cup was on. I think I watched a lot of soccer. Um, and I, I saw another psychologist. I saw another doctor. My medication was changed. Um, my, I, I, my, the psychologist I saw actually began to really give me some coping mechanisms and just some breathing exercises so that when these racing thoughts began to kind of take hold, I, I could just stop and breathe and just kind of um, that's probably the start of my kind of mindfulness and meditation type exercises which we can touch on later but it's uh, it's definitely just some breathing exercises and bringing myself back to, to my breath really kind of um, can really was a, a strategy that I, I use to this day to help kind of quell the, those thoughts um, so doctor and psychologist got me to the point of where I felt that I could go back to Melbourne which was great started my um, second semester um, and I was taking medication, using my um, coping mechanisms, managed to pass all my exams, caught up on my placements and um, passed university. Um, and like, sure, there were stressful times walking into an exam. Yes, I'd be stressed, but a few deep breaths, focus on the kind of here and now and just kind of um, stop, breathe, relax. And I got through. Um, and it's it's just trying to trying to ride those anxiety waves um, and try try and ride those um, to to the point of where you feel like you're able to kind of keep going. Um, so after university, um, I started full time work. It, now's a good time. If there's has there been any questions or any any comments or anything on Facebook, Craig? Anything on Facebook, Craig? Sorry, the any any questions comments on Facebook? Oh, there's a few comments. I was going to hold them over to nearer the end. Um, but what, what, if, you would, if, there's no, if there's no questions, then... well, let's. Kylie just made a comment about the breathing. Um, so sort of yep. come back to where we can get some tips on the the breathing kind of issues, those calming kinds types of. Um... Yeah, I'll touch on that in a moment, Kylie. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so after uni. I'll kick back on with my story and um, I get more onto my kind of coping, me my coping mechanisms a bit more in a minute. After university, I kind of started full-time work and after six months of um, being in kind of away from university, um, doing full-time work, I was in a really good headspace. I was like, I'm, I'm going well. Um, Is she I've got Joe? a job. Yeah. Joe, can I just ask, when you say work, if... I, I, the comment I'm going to make is um, self-employed, running your own business, or an employee yep. with less stre less stresses. Is yeah, so I was what? I was a graduate. I was a graduate at a, uh, at a in a private practice um, in 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 Hobart. Quite a busy private practice. So I was I was was seeing patients, doing a variety of different work um, from a generalist point point of view. Um, but didn't have too much didn't have too much stress. I was back living at home. Um, mum and dad had moved back to Hobart, so uh, yeah, I was I was in a in a very um, a very controlled environment, you would say. Um, so not a great deal of stress, and so not a great deal of stress meant that I felt that I was on top of the world. I was really really doing good things. Um, I thought that I was like I was exercising, and I thought that everything was fine. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to come off my medication. Because I, I think things are great. Um, I think I'm I'm in I'm in control. I've got some good coping mechanisms. I was I I felt that I didn't need to see a psychologist because I was in control. And I thought, you know what? I've I've beaten this depression thing. Piece of cake. It's easy. Um, and then my attention at work just began to to wander. Letters began to not get done. Notes began to not be finished as well as what they were. Um, and then a few major events happened. A relationship I was in at the time ended. And I broke my collarbone, all within about a week of each other. Um, and as a as a graduate podiatrist, breaking your collarbone isn't advisable. Um, but it then ended with me kind of having four weeks, four to six weeks off work, which was pretty much complete rest, so no physical activity. Um, and so combining that with not being on medication and not seeing my psychologist, it actually um, I was also fearful that my boss wanted would sack me because I'd broken my collarbone. Um, and so then I probably rushed back to work a little bit quicker because I wanted to get back to work because I didn't want to let 
let them down. Um, and then in my first few weeks of work, I was at the point of where I was, again, at a stage of where I was having panic attacks. Like I was in, in front of patients. I was worried that I was going to get the diagnosis wrong. I had rapid breathing. I had, um, I, I was at the point of where I can remember one patient, I was almost crying um, and I had to turn turn away from them because I was so anxious. And the anxiety was then um, being fueled by the fact that I thought that I was going to then be labelled the crazy podiatrist um, that no one would ever want to see because I was like crying in the middle of a consult. Um, and it, it, it's something that, that then obviously added fuel to the fire of my anxiety. So I managed to hold it together. And But I, I got to lunch and kind of opened the door of my... Um, clinic owner or the, 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 the clinic owner and just burst into tears again and again you come to the point of this clinic owner was like joe just go home see your doctor go says go see the psychologist your, your job's here when you come back we, we we want what's best for you we want you to seek the help that you deserve um so again like everyone has sick days everyone has accidents but People want what's best for you, but you've got to want to seek the help. You've got to want to help yourself. Um, and so, you, again, my medication was adjusted, back to see the psych psychologist um, and back to kind of getting back on top of these kind of coping mechanisms. Um, so to, that was probably about eight years ago, I think. Um, and so now I'm holding down a, a full-time job. I'm just at the point of where we've just taken on a graduate podiatrist. So beginning to kind of that mentoring journey, which is um, obviously it's stressful and it's different, but it's I'm in, enjoying that. Um, I enjoy helping people. I enjoy being a podiatrist. I enjoy doing this as a, as a, as a bit of a passion project um, and involved with the podiatry association na nationally. I'm on a few committees and enjoy furthering the podiatry profession and, um, making sure that we're the, the foot and ankle experts that we should so well be. Um, and we recognise as that. Um, I've done a few little, done a few little things um, along the way where I have, um, so I'm not sure Griff, if many people in England are aware of Kokoda. Um, Kokoda is a, a famous war, a war um, I guess it's a, it's a, it's an area or it's a path, Craig, path, bushwalk. Yeah. Track. It's about a hundred, track it's about 100 kilometers in papua new guinea and it's kind of um dense rainforest and it's really synonymous with world mm -hmm. world war Two. so it was where the australian and japanese forces really had had a um a pretty significant battle um and it's really synonymous with its tropical rainforest vertical like really steep jungle really dense thick ra rainforest so a few years ago i walked the kokoda track to raise money for beyond blue so um as a as a team, we raised about eighty thousand dollars. There was twelve of us. Um, of that, I raised about twelve thousand dollars, and it um, it was something that I really enjoyed the, the the physical challenge, but also the the mental challenge of um, doing that was was pretty tough. Um, so I underwent six months of full training, um, walking up and down Mount Wellington with a twenty kilogram pack um, on my back. So Mount Wellington's the mountain that. The, um, that Hobart, the city that I live in, is based. The Point to Pinnacle, which I spoke about before, is a half marathon up that mountain. And so this is both physically and men mentally challenging. You've got a backpack on, you're kind of walking uphill, it's tough, but you've got no choice to continue. You've got kind of, um, you can't just stop in the middle of a mountain with a backpack on. You've either got to go up or you've got to go down. Um, and it's kind of, sure, I took breaks, sure, I stopped, had a drink, got, got my breath. But I kind of look at this little kind of example as a, it's not like a, a kind of something that I look at as life. It's like, yes, it's tough, but you just stop, break it down into small little steps and then keep going. Um, and like my training was made easy by the fact that I had a plan. I sought help of a strength and conditioning coach. I, I spoke to people that had done Kokoda. I spoke to uh, people that, that were also going on it. So it's much lot, and I kind of use this as, a, as an example of men, mental health. I see my GP to get help. I see my psychologist to get help. I speak to other people that that, that suffer to see what kind of works for them or how how their journey is going. And um, when it's tough, I reassure them. And then when it when I'm going through periods of 
being down, then they reassure me. And it's much the same as the whole journey of kind of Kokoda. We were kind of 12 people. There was times where one of us was not doing great, so we'd pick them up and get them along. Um, it was tough. Life is tough. And I'm pretty sure that everyone in the, in the past 12 to 18 months realises that life is life can be shit and life can be hard. But we've got to keep, we've got to, together we've got to get through. And I think that that's what community is. And I really hope that with COVID, I hope that what we see out of this is, is that the power of community. Um, the other thing is that a common misconception is, is that people with depression and anxiety are mentally weak. And I, this pisses me off <laughs> um, because people with depression and anxiety, we're actually incredibly strong because each day the things that are happening below the surface, just to get, just to get through, uh, like it's, it can be an incredibly tough day. There are some people that standing up out of bed is a win for that day. And you're not mentally weak. It's a medical condition. It's like any other medical condition. Yes, okay, it's not, you can't see it. But I take a tablet which helps regulate chemicals in my brain. No different to a diabetic taking a tablet to help regulate blood sugar levels. It's, not, it's a tablet, it's a medical condition. So we really need to kind of move away from there being a stigma around taking medication because it, it can be really powerful and it can help. Um, so to, to what my coping mechanisms are now is that I still see my psychologist every, every, every two, four, six weeks, depending on how I'm going. I'm a, a new father. Um, so before I, before in the, 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 the last six months, I've probably seen them every two weeks. And before the birth, I saw I saw them every two weeks, um, and throw COVID in there as well. Probably <laughs> saw them a, a little bit around with that. Um, my psychologist and I have really worked on um, me accepting my condition, and I'm now at the point of where I'm, I've accepted my condition to the point of where I can share it. I feel that I can share it openly and honestly because this is me. This is who I, who I am. So. Part of that is a, the concept of ACT, which is acceptance and commitment therapy. And um, there's a few books that I've read and listened to a few podcasts, and I'll let Craig put those in the comments. Um, but I guess I'm conscious of who I am, the person that I want to be, and the goals that I've got. Um, but that also doesn't mean that life's not going to be tough. So I, I accept that when I'm having a bad day and I focus on me, I focus on my family, I focus on my health. Um, my... The, the 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 breathing and the the mindfulness is something that I've really practiced or that I, I work and practice on with my psychologist. Um, I use an app called Smiling Mind. It's a free app. There's a there's a heap of um, there's a heap of free apps, but it's a guided meditation app. Which there are there are a number of different um, apps out there, both paid and unpaid. Um, I think that whatever works for you, whatever works, it might just be that that exercise where you where you focusing on your breath running it might be um swimming where you're focusing on your breath or it might just be doing doing that exercise it's just something that that makes you feel better or whether it is actually just taking stock and but of your lunch break putting the the treatment bed down and putting some headphones in and just doing doing some breathing exercises um trust me i do that i do that a lot um get vertical on a podiatry bed with uh, the smiling mind in and occasionally having a 30 month old I, I might doze off to sleep um, I, I'm, I'm incredibly lucky that I've got a great support network. I've got, um, my family, my family and friends and my mum and dad, my mum especially has been amazing to get me to the point of where I am, um, in terms of seeking the help that I, that I deserve. Um, my fam, my, I'm very honest with my friends. I can remember back to university and to this day now, like I, they, they joke about the tablet that I take. Not joke, but they say, what happens if I take that tablet? And I say, probably nothing. I wouldn't do it, though. Um, but uh, it, it's a, it's a t it's, it is something that I'm, I guess I'm just honest. It's me. It's a tablet. It's no different. Um, I, I let my work colleagues know that and my friends know that I am medicated for anxiety and depression so that if they see something that's not necessarily right or if they see a bit of a trend going, that, I, that they can intervene. Um, not intervene, but just have a chat. Um, and having a chat, I know that the things that I do of having a chat. Um, and there's a there's a, a, a Movember thing that I, I I spoke to anyone that listens called Alec, and that's ask ask a question, listen, 
um, listen for encouragement. Sorry, listen without judgment or distractions. Encourage action and check in. So Alec, if anyone wants to take something away from today that they want to check in with someone, remember Alec. It's, a four, it's four letters to keep in your back pocket about how you can approach to chatting a mate. The other thing that I'd, I'd add to that is um, asking questions, ask the second and third questions. So not the first question of how are you going? It's the second and third questions that matter. It's like, how are you going? I've noticed that things aren't too good at the moment or you're changed. Is there anything that I that I can do? And just go a bit deeper. Um, and that, that takes, not everyone, not everyone can necessarily do that. But as health professionals, I think we're actually quite skilled at asking those second and third questions. Um, look, I I am um, I accept that I go through ups and downs, and recovery for me doesn't necessarily mean that I've beaten this. It just means that at this point in time, I'm managed. For the like six, like I look like at the moment that I've got my head screwed on and my shit together. Six six months ago, I was at the point of where I was considering going back to a psychiatrist to get my medication changed because life was tough. I had, I was a new father, there was COVID. So it is not something that I, I take lightly. I'm in a good spot at, at this particular time, but that good spot might not be so good in a little, a, a little while. And, and part of that is that I do get worried that what I, I get, not, not frustrated, but I get, I probably, I'm, I'm risk averse because I don't necessarily want to take too much on um, because I, I'm worried about how my mental health will affect that. Um, but that's something that I still continue to work with my, my psychologist. Um, and it's the condition lays dormant. It might rear its head again, but if it does rear its head again, I know that I've got great support around me. I know that I've got awesome family and friends and I know that things can and will get better. Um, so there's obviously a number of resources um, out there that, that that people can reach and that people can can kind of um, a access. We've got a decent list of the resources both in Australia and the UK that Craig's going to pop up at the end of this. Um, it's also important to know that it might not necessarily be you that is experiencing the mental health condition. It might be someone close to you. And those people are just as important as the actual sufferers because it's, it requires a, to, to be a mental health sufferer, it, we, we aim for you to be open and honest, but also to be someone that, that is supporting someone with a mental health concern, you need to be so incredibly patient and so understanding, which that can, that, that can get really thin and it can be really tough. But the people that are looking after people that have got mental health conditions also need as much help if not more, to help those people. Um, I guess the thing that I'd probably like to, to sum up all of today is that it's important for us to all understand the signs and symptoms of depression and anxiety so that we can recognise it with one another and we can then um, get everyone, get the people that are suffering to have, to get the help that they deserve. And that's professional help. It's not, it's not our job as the community to help you it's our job to help you get help it's and that's the key thing is is that we need to get people getting the help that they deserve it might be that they just need some time to go and exercise and if you can if you can facilitate a loved one to go and do something for them then that can be sensational for their mental mental health everyone's journey is different and everyone will cope in different ways it's about having the healthy coping mechanisms but also the biggest thing is is that know that you can get help and know that you can get to the point of where you're not struggling because help is out there, both um, so GP, psychologist, but also there's a lot of healthy coping mechanisms, exercise, eating well, meditation, mindfulness, all these things that you can start by doing now and just um, can then make you feel just that little, little, bit, little bit better and just turn that corner. But if you've been struggling for a long period of time, then you might need some professional help. Much like if you've got a sore foot, you need to see a podiatrist. If you've got something that needs, if you need something, if you've got 
something that's really bothering you or if you're feeling down in the dumps or if you're, you're really um, catastrophizing or going through wells of thoughts, then have a chat to your doctor, have a chat to, have a chat to a loved one or have a chat to someone and say, look, I, I, I need to get some help. Um, that's pretty much it from me. Yeah, <laughs> Sorry. Th- for thanks, just, Joe. I've yeah, uh, look, spoken. Joe, look, look th- thanks so much for sharing that, Joe. Look, for everyone's information, when, when this is over, I'll post in the comments, the Australian Podiatry Association has a list of resources. Um, the College of Podiatry in the UK has a confidential service for their members. There are other things in other countries. So I'll post links to all those when we're finished. But what I want to do, and I hope Bindi doesn't mind this, she's posted a comment here and I just one sentence in this comment that she made um, really jumped out at me you know she said your confidence inspires me you know in the past few years since three late miscarriages had issues with my mental health your comment about being being strong brought tears to my eyes and I think this last sentence it, 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 you know I talk openly to patients and colleagues to break the stigma and then here and have found many in return open up to me and I think that that's quite telling that last little bit there about them opening up is causing other people to open up and well. And I think that that does bring home a good message. Yeah, it's it's tough. Like I I also share that I like I kind of share with patients that I that I'm an anxiety and depression sufferer. Um, it then gets and like this right now, it then gets very very tricky in terms of um, seeing if you can or you we're not there to diagnose people that have got anxiety and depression okay. we're there to just push people to get the help that they deserve mm. sorry this is bonty my dog um <laughs> yeah. another great support mechanism but it's it is definitely something that that you can just listen and listening is so powerful like mm. a to get someone to open up to you is is awesome but also then to listen and i know that mm. we can often interrupt people but we we're not there to, to help. We're not there to, to tell people what to do when it comes to men, mental mental health. As as family and friends, we're there to really listen, and we're there to to take in their concerns and take in their frustrations and take in their feelings, and then and then respond by acknowledging that we've listened. So respond by having showed that we've listened, and then get them to to take the next steps. And and it might just be something along the lines of saying. Thank you so much for sharing. What can I do to facilitate you to get the help that you deserve? Mm. Or it might be, okay, what do you think the next steps are in this journey for you? So what what can you do? And that those things, and you're not you're not telling them what to do. You're asking that rhetorical question. And if they say it, then I need to see someone. Then it's like, well, have you considered your GP? Yeah. Have you considered um, your psychologist? Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Look. Debbie's raised a really interesting question point here. I think many registered health professionals may fear seeking help in case it may impact on their ability to work and stay registered. And that's a, a quite a real concern that I, I suspect some health professionals will have. So do you have any thoughts on that sort of observation? Um, it's a tricky one. I, like mm. I've heard anecdotally of doctors that have seen, that have paid other doctors cash so that they so that they're to get kind of help so that it's not registered within Medicare that, that they're being seen. Um, mm-hmm. I've heard of a variety of different things and that's counterintuitive. And I imagine that that is something that um, organisations like Beyond Blue are working towards to try and help with that. Um, I don't think it's as much of a concern for allied health professionals, um, but I think that it's something that we're definitely aware of. And I think that it's definitely something that's being worked upon. I I don't, I, I think that, to have my my comment would be you've got to be in a good sound state of mind to be able to help people but you've got to want to be able to help people to get help yourself and so it's a bit of a kind of a, a circle um it yeah it's a real it's a real problem and to the other thing within mental health is um discrimination against insurance and life insurance and those kind of things like i i've got i've got a a, a, a caveat on my mental um, on my life insurance that says that if anything happens to do with men, mental health, anything, I can't claim income protection insurance. I can't claim, um, I can't claim uh, life insurance or anything along those lines, which is counterintuitive to, for people to get the help. So, whilst we've still got 
we've got a lot of work to do. Um, I'd argue that me seeing a psychologist every two weeks and taking medication is better coping mechanism than the person that drinks a bottle of vodka a night to cope. Um, and I'm probably a better I'm probably a better risk to take as a as an insurance product. But that's just me, and that's um, unfortunately the black and white that comes with insurance companies and I'll stop there before I get a bit animated and a bit uh, <laughs> annoyed. Joe, jo, you sort of spoke to this when you, in your story and, it, and, it, and it, it reflects back on things you've just said about the, you know, we use the word stigma, but when we think about physical health, we all accept that physical health, we, we all have a physical health status at any moment in time and we may be doing very well, we may have a musculoskeletal complaint, we may have a medical complaint, we, we may one day suddenly have to call in to work because we are, we are bedridden with influenza uh, or, or something similar. So we accept the ebbs and flows of physical health. Um, yet with mental health, it feels like people sort of, it either doesn't exist or we are having a mental health episode, rather than all of us quite clearly being on a continuum, we're all somewhere on the same continuum at any yeah. given moment in time. We should probably, as you've already said, with, with the stresses of life, with bills and, and young children and pandemics, we, we should, the expectation should absolutely be that our mental health will ebb and flow in many ways, probably more than our physical health. And it should be pretty reasonable that, men, uh, that medical insurance would cover it the same way they do, uh, you know, physical health problems. It should be reasonable that if we call up because we need a mental health day, it's no different to calling up to say, I've got diarrhea and vomiting you know it is you know uh, uh, i didn't realize the stigma went so deeply i must admit you've just opened my eyes to that stigma going so deeply to the level of like you say medical insurance companies so how do we ever hope to uh, as a society sort of start accepting that it's not a sign of weakness that that we're all on this continuum somehow how, how do we how do we break this cycle what 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 are your experiences with that and, and, and perhaps what you know about being linked in with, with the organisation that you are as well? I think it's, uh, I guess it's, it's to, to break stigma is to normalise. So when you kind of look at statistics, but it's then also stories. And that's part of the reason that Beyond Blue have people that share their stories to normalise these things, to, to, to get people realising that this is something that is real and out there. Um, it's, you, it's then also if people do have these concerns, they need to raise them. And um, if it is if, if it is discrimination, then raise them with Beyond Blue or um, there's a, an organisation in Australia called Stigma Watch. Um, but it, it, is it something that we're going to change overnight? No. Is it something that we can hopefully progressively get towards being better? Yes. And if you kind of look at where where we've been, kind of there's now like we used to asylums used to be locking people up for all sorts of various reasons and those people are now integrated into our society so we're moving in the right direction and mm. i guess that the only thing that i'm in control of is me and i i guess i would say that each and every one of us that we can hopefully try and move towards having these more open and honest conversations um and it, it's tough that i the, the risk that you take is when you do open yourself up that you can get hurt that someone can then discriminate against you but to be quite honest and frank if someone does do that to me i don't really want them as i don't really want them i don't i don't i don't even want them as if someone doesn't want to see me because i've got depression or anxiety as a podiatrist go find someone else i don't i don't really want to help you <laughs> but would so, you agree would you agree joe that like we have come a long way in the last 10 years We've yeah, still got a long way to go. Still a long way to go, but I think there's been a, there's been a big yeah. change. And I think it'll be like most things. It'll be that generation. So I think that the next generation's coming through, um, and there'll be there'll be things like and I'm sure that there's workplaces that that, that now the ones that that want people to be comfortable, um, they'll have policies that 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 mean that that you can work from home if you're not feeling too well, or that you can take a take a day here or take a day there and and they probably mm -hmm. reward that honesty um of saying that you know what i'm feeling pretty crap and it's like everything though that if those people if if that policy is then exploited I presume that they'll people then lose 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 the right to, to to have that access to them so it's a bit it no system's perfect and no system will catch every everyone but what i'd say is that the only thing that we, each and every one of us is in control of is our own actions and 
within that, it's getting help, but it's also being open and honest, and it's also supporting the people around us. And by hopefully doing what we, what each and every one of us can do, then it's those kind of um, those ways can then push push that stigma away and can help people get the help that they deserve, and can mean that we we normalise me- mental health. But doing things like this is hopefully normalising this. Um, hopefully normalising mental health. So thank you for the opportunity. No, I mean, th- th- thanks for sharing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, thank you so much for your story and probably a special shout out required to your mum, who sounds like an absolute rock star, <laughs> it has to be said. Um, so we can, she's, a, she's an East Ender. So she's, uh, she's, she's my mum is, is uh, an interesting personality. <laughs> we, we clash occasionally, but she's got a heart of gold. Yeah, she sounds awesome. So, um, yeah, I think the thing, I don't know if there are any more questions, Craig, and I know we're getting close no. to the hour, but I think the thing for me that, that I would say to people is to get down into the comments. Craig's going to leave links to loads of resources, not just the charities, but but the links um, or the the, uh, the the thing I think that I really took from, from what Joe said was the, the the skills or the ability or the, 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 the abbreviation to have that first conversation. That, that which clearly sounds the most difficult thing to do um it was alec wasn't it joe so uh, get down into the comments craig's going to link all to link to all of them joe follows our page anyway so if you've got any questions for him if you're watching this not live um or if you're listening to the podcast and you want to ask joe something dive onto our facebook page get down into the comments um tag joe in them or, or tag us in them and we'll we'll get them under his nose um because i think i'm right in saying joe you you're, you're totally happy and, and keen to keep discussing this with people as much as they want yeah absolutely absolutely like this doesn't stop this this is one hour of our day mental health doesn't stop it'll keep going so i'm more than happy for people to to reach out it's obviously something though that and again i'm not a professional i can only let you know what has worked for me and so probably the things that i'll say is is that thanks for sharing and I, i i'm i'm here and i'm listening to you but it sounds like you need some help and that's probably i i want like I want to try and help people get help. And so I'm here to listen and I'm here to to help people. But also it's it's also that it might be something that they want to clarify. I'm more than happy to, to chat. And, and that's the benefit of social media. People can inbox, people can talk, people can chat. And it's probably a, a little bit easier to type a message than to have that face-to-face conversation. But um, any, any open and honest conversation is a good conversation. Awesome. Great. Look, thanks so much, Joe. As, as Joe, Joe and Ian have said, I will put some links to resources in the um, comments. The, this video will be up on YouTube later today. The audio version will be there. Just by way of winding up, I think Ian and I have had, we get a lot of feedback on what we do. Um, we, we do like it, but I think we've just got a comment come in, which is probably the best bit of feedback I think we've ever had. So I'd just like to put it up. And Debbie's made a comment here. I think this podcast episode is going to help so many people. And I think that's the best feedback we've ever had. So thanks thanks for that, Debbie. And thanks so much, um, Joe, for your time. Um, thanks, and... buddy. Thank you. At, at least you managed to avoid the uh, Alex Ross. Um, yeah, we've run out yeah. of time, but once we stop going live, stay on the line. I've got a few things we need to say. <laughs> okay, so you guys. Good.